Last week, we explored the collapse of the Qing as China officially became reunited under the rulership of Yuan Shikai. By this point, most governors officially recognized the republican government, but the reality on the ground was completely different. Let's explore the next period of Chinese history, as by the end of this video, any semblance of Chinese unity is broken. In March, the republican government decided to reunite Ningxia into the larger Gansu province. Over in southern China, there is the Guizhou province. In this province, the army and the revolutionaries had compromised upon their independence, but this would now cause internal chaos within the province, until one faction called on Shai E from the neighboring Yunnan province to come in to restore order in the region. Tang Xiao, a general loyal to Shai E, would be placed in control. Over in Tibet, forces loyal to the Dalai Lama overran the forces of Zong, allowing for the unification of Tibet. Tibet would then attempt to expand their control over the Kham province, though their efforts would be repelled. Still, the Dalai Lama could now formally declare Tibetan independence in February of 1913. Over in northern China, the city of Barga was occupied by a Mongol warlord, though it became little more than a Russian Clyde state, co-ruled by a Russian Cossack. Further north, the Mongols would finally seize the disconnected region of Kaft for themselves. Following this success, the Mongols would launch an invasion into the outer Chahar province of Inner Mongolia. This would sever the geographic bridge to the Heilongjiang region, which turned into a practically autonomous province. The Mongols would continue their march south while capturing large amounts of Inner Mongolia. During this time, elections would be held for the parliament and the prime minister of China. The Kuomintang, or the Nationalist Party, would gain the majority of the seats, but Song Zhaoren, the candidate for the Kuomintang, would be assassinated on a train, with allies of Yuan Shikai suspected to be responsible for the attack, since Song had campaigned hard on the weakening of presidential power, while Yuan was working hard to consolidate more and more power into himself as the president. Back to the map, Yuan would give control of the Jiangxi province to the governor of Hubei our old friend Li Yuanhong, the governor who began it all. He would also work to crush the citizens' army in Henan, which was a bandit army roaming around the region. Finally, Yuan would use the Mongol invasion as a pretext to seize control over most of the Zhenxi province, due to a plot by Yan Jishan, the governor of the province, against Yuan. We would then see the start of the Second Revolution, as back in the Jiangxi province, we see Li Yunzhang seized by revolutionary leaders. This would be the spark for a larger war, where some provinces rebelled against Yuan's influence and abuses of power. The revolutionaries would swiftly seize the Jiangxi province back from Hubei forces. Over in Sichuan, the western portion of the province would secede as Xuanbian as a neutral province in the raging conflict. In the east of the nation, Zhejiang would also declare their neutrality in the larger conflict. From here, Yuan would start a massive southern campaign into Anhui and Jiangsu. While the Anhui would stabilize and push back somewhat, the government of Jiangsu, now mostly occupied, would cancel their declaration of independence. Yuan would begin a battle for the important city of Shanghai, managing to gain control over it. Meanwhile down south, we have a battle between Jiangxi and Guangdong. As Jiangxi forces advance further and further, Guangdong cancels their independence, but Guangxi forces refuse to cancel their invasion in return. Sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with the two videos I release every single week, consider doing so. Thank you. Over in Sichuan, a new warlord, Chang Kewu, seizes control over most of the Sichuan province. A grave mistake, since this would lead to Yuan calling both Yunnan and Chuanbian into the conflict. Following this, the Hunan province cancels its independence as well, while both Guangdong and Jiangxi capitulate and are absorbed by their enemies. Yuan's personal eastern push also bears fruit, as the revolutionaries are now practically defeated and his rule secured. Further consolidating, Yuan seizes Jiangxi from Li's control, while over in the Sichuan theater, Xiong Kiwu was coming under increasing stain. But still, he was not ready to give up. A rebellion down in the Jiangxi province would mean Yunnanese forces had to be redirected, allowing Chong a small period of resurgence. But by October, both rebellions had been fully pacified. Yuan could now again focus on consolidating control over the nation, recalling the governor of Zhejiang, placing it under central control. 
Tensions between Yunnan and Chai E, the governor of Yunnan, would lead to Yuan placing Chai under house arrest, sparking anarchy in Yunnan as Tang Zhao, governor of Guizhou, breaks away from Yunnan and launches an invasion, soon coming under control over the entire province. He would give control over Guizhou over to Liu Xianxai, focusing on Yunnan instead. Guangdong had fallen under control of Long Jiguang, a brutal warlord fighting on behalf of Yuan Shikai. In Yunnan, an uprising would challenge Tang's control over Yunnan, though he would manage to suppress it before the end of the month. Yunnan would then further cement his control over all of eastern China. While all this was ongoing, the Mongolian front had grinded into a stalemate. And now, Russia and China had come to an understanding. Mongolia would retreat their forces from Inner Mongolia, though achieving minor territorial expansion. China would continue to claim Mongolia as a part of it, while Mongolia maintained their claims on Inner Mongolia. Russia, meanwhile, didn't recognize Mongolian independence, but did vow to protect its status as a special, autonomous entity within China. Tuva received a similar deal, but would soon be proclaimed a Russian protectorate. But while things were looking up for Yuan, he would fail to break Yan Shishan, who retook most of the Shanxi province. Down south, Shanxi would be awarded to Li Shun. By December, Yuan dismissed parliament, being re-elected without a national vote and further centralizing his authority. Over in Sichuan, the entire province would be reunified after the fall of Xuanbian. A big reorganization of the Gansu province returned Ningxia as an autonomous, special region of Gansu under the rulership of Ma Fushang. Ma being the Chinese name for Muhammad since these Ma warlords were Muslim. Over in Europe, the death of a certain archduke had sparked a little-known conflict called World War I, which would send shockwaves across the world, which would soon reach China as well, as Japan entered the war on the Antan side, resulting in the Japanese capturing the city of Qingdao, a port concession previously held by the Germans. But Japan didn't stop there. Using the pressure of the World War, Japan issued the 21 demands to Yuan Shikai, demanding economic rights across much of China especially in Manchuria, with some further articles practically stipulating Japanese economic dominance over the entirety of China. Yuan understood that refusing could mean war with the Japanese, and that due to the war in Europe and Japan's place amongst the Entente, the West would do nothing to help him, leading him to accepting 14 out of the 21 demands made. But whether or not he had a choice in the matter wasn't really relevant, as accepting any demands at all made Yuan incredibly unpopular, as he was now seen selling out Chinese independence to Japan. The Gansu province would then take another hit, as the Qinghai province also broke away as a special region, before Yuan would take direct control over Sichuan, Jiangxi and Gansu. But Yuan, completely misreading his position, had declared himself the Emperor of China in December, sparking further outrage. Yuan would go on to seize direct control over Guangdong, but from this peak, things would only start to go downhill. Because we would soon see the start of the National Protection War against Yuan. Yunnan would cut ties with the central government, as rebellions broke out in Hunan and Guangdong, while Yuan's forces attempted to invade Yunnan. Yunnan's forces, led by the reinstated governor Chai E, would begin marching east, soon seizing control over Guizhou again while repelling Yuan's invasion. From here, Yunnanese forces would begin an invasion of Sichuan, pushing to the Yangtze River. Following this, several minor warlords in Sichuan would declare their opposition to Yuan as well. This would also mean that from this point forward, Sichuan would be the most chaotic and divided province following this war. Down south, Guangxi would also join against Yuan, launching an invasion of Guangdong. Yuan, recognizing his severe mistake, abdicated as emperor, choosing to return to his post as dictator president, but the opposition wasn't willing to accept this. As Yuan's control over southern China was further challenged, first Jiangxi and then Zhejiang broke away from his rule as well. Making matters even worse, revolutionary hero Sun Yat-sen would return from exile, while the Kuomintang launched a rebellion in Shanghai, soon leading to the entire Jiangsu province declaring independence. Over in the west, Yunnanese forces would secure most of western Sichuan, soon followed by Yuan's forces being completely pushed from the province. 
As Yuan's position became increasingly unholdable, Shandong and Hunan would also join the opposition. From this position, the once powerful Yuan would die from health complications in June, bringing about an end to the National Protection War. When the dust was settled, this was the new reality in China. In the south, the warlords of Yunnan and Jiangxi had built themselves some small realms of influence. Officially, Yunnan also controlled all of Sichuan, but in reality, smaller warlords fought for control amongst themselves. The presidency of China was taken up by Li Yuanhong, while Duan Shire would become prime minister. And yes, this is the same Li Yuanhong that began the revolution in Hubei all those years ago. Yunnan would attempt once more to gain total control over Sichuan, achieving military success, but upon the death of their governor, Yunnan would lose control over their other provinces. Making use of this opportunity, Xuanbian would come under attack from all sides, leading to its conquest. Lu Chuanhao would then start a campaign to reunify Sichuan, but this would spark both Yunnan and Guizhou to invade the province to prevent this. But back to the high politics, the Republic of China was rocked by a severe political debate about Chinese involvement in World War I. This debate would cause the Chinese Republic to start splintering between two factions. The Zheli in the north, who wanted to stay out of the war and focus on the peaceful reunification of China, but opposing them were the Anhui, supported by Duan Jire, the Prime Minister, hoping to receive Japanese backing in a forceful reunification of China. Li Yuanhong, the president, was supposed to be neutral between the two factions, but relations between him and Duan worsened as time went on, leading to Li firing Duan as prime minister. This would lead to Duan and his Anhui to start mobilizing for a march north to overthrow Li as president. Li would request Zhang Chun, the governor of Jiangsu, to come to Beijing and mediate the conflict. This would prove to be a massive mistake, as Zhang would overthrow Li and in a surprise move restore the Qing Empire. Following this, Li would resign his presidency and give Duan his position as premier back if they could suppress this uprising. Duan would quickly march to Beijing to restore order and the entire Qing restoration only lasted 12 days in total. Up north, Heilongjiang had supported the Qing restoration and had therefore been invaded and incorporated into Fengchang. But then, information surfaced that the Germans had funded Zhang Kun's restoration attempt, leading to Duan declaring war on the Germans, entering China into World War I. This would lead to a decisive split of the Zheli and Anhui cliques, the two main actors in the next chapter of the Chinese warlord era. But that's a story for next week. For now, this is where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content and subscribe for two more videos every single week. To continue watching, click on one of the two videos on screen now. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.